Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and tonight I am delighted to be joined once again by Kevin Miles. of the past and watched history unfold Go in a park head with my dad and my brother It's true what they say, we're a club like no other The colours that flow through my veins are all green, white and gold The sun it shines down as we're walking along London Road The Green Brigade burst into song and the jungle explodes So what does it mean to be Celtic and how does it feel? To pull on the hoops and be fearless like Billy McNeil Oh Celtic, 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 my heart and my soul I followed the teams of the past and watched history unfold Go in a park head with my dad and my brother It's true what they say, we're a club like no other The colours that flow through my veins are all green, white and gold They came in their thousands to Lisbon and Jock had a plan He understood football was nothing without the fans We went to go down before Gemma and Chalmers would save us Our jerseys don't fit second best or inferior players Oh Celtic, 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 my heart and my soul I followed the teams of the past and watched history unfold Go in a park head with my dad and my brother It's true what they say, we're a club like no other The colours that flow through my veins are all green, white and gold He's picked up, yet. Yeah. let me hear you sing along Celtic, 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 my heart and my soul I followed the teams of the past and watched history unfold Go in a park head with my dad and my brother It's true what they say, we're a club like no other The colours that flow through my veins are all green, white and gold Thank you very much. Going back as well, you mentioned to me before we started recording that you play fives. I've seen you playing yourself for the Celtic Greats. Were you a player in your, your youth? Did you play yourself? No, I was never a player, Paul. I played through school and just played with local teams in East Kilbride. But my brother was the player. My brother had um, he made his professional debut, played with Stenhouse Muir but played most of his career in the juniors. So he was with Lanark for a long time, he won the league with Lanark, he was a top goal scorer, two seasons in the bounce. And he also won the Scottish Junior Cup with Shots Bon Accord. I think it was the 2011-2012 season. They beat Auckland Left Talbot in the final. Um, so he had a bit of prestige and he, he, he could have been a player, um, but just injuries and other bits and pieces. It's just an all too familiar story. And then my papa's uncle George Gray, he played with Scarborough. He played with... Kettering Town, um, so he was a professional footballer as well, so it kind of ran in the family as well, but um, I was proud of my brother for what he'd achieved in football, I think I just played and then got to an age where I got distracted by music and um, ditched the football and picked up the guitar. No, it's a good distraction, Kevin. We had Ken McCluskey on the podcast just the other night there, and obviously he done exactly the same and ended up with the Bluebells, who had a number one hit, and he just explained there comes a time where you know, you've got to hang up the football boots and, and start playing music because that, that becomes a more powerful pull for you. I mean, I, I've never been musical in relation to playing an instrument. I've always loved music, Kevin. So when you were growing up, was there musical instruments lying about the house? Was your dad a, a big influence on you? 
Um, no, I was really the first one in the family that got involved with music in any capacity. Um, and it was mostly just through people that I'd become pals with through school. That was where the football interest died out and the music interest picked up because my best pals coming through school weren't really that interested in football. It was more about music and you just pick up common interests the people who you surround yourself with at that age. So we had one of my pals was a drummer, another one was a guitarist, and I ended up picking up the guitar as well and we started a, a band of sorts. Um, there was a place in East Kilbride called the Key Youth Centre, so it was like a community centre and they had a, a rehearsal space for young people um, and we used to just go down there and make a racket. Uh, but that was like the sort of very early stages of starting to get any music. I picked it up through school, but I always found it really difficult to, like practical music was difficult. I couldn't read music, I couldn't sight read, but I just loved playing and I liked being creative with it. So. I suppose like the early signs of it were there from a young age that that's what I wanted to do was to write songs and not be playing other people's tunes but to be creating my own. See what you mentioned there about a, a space for young aspiring musicians to go and kind of find themselves and, and practice with their mates and get bands together. I think it's really important to have spaces like that or boxing clubs or areas that you can go and play football, Kevin. And I think we're missing a trick because Scotland has produced world-class boxers, musicians and footballers. We are capable of doing that. And people are asking why we don't do it anymore. And I think it's all down to facilities. And if you give kids at a certain age the opportunity to go and just express themselves and develop at their own pace, then it will get to the stage where they might want to choose one, two or the, or the other. And we might get back to a stage where we're actually producing world-class talents so on the football field. I think of the three, the one that's probably survived has been the music, to be honest with you. And it, love them or loathe them, people like, you know, Lewis Capaldi, who's selling a lot of records in America, yep. uh, has come through fairly recently. Jerry Cinnamon, who's done it a completely different way. And he divides, he polarises opinion, uh, you know, I love the guy, I love what he's done. He's just kind of grabbed it by the balls and, and ran with it himself and, and fair play to him. But I just think we need to harness the talent. The talent is always there. Someone the other week said on a podcast about, you know, this this it was, it's become a cliche, or, you know, kids are too interested in mobile phones and computers, but you get the same technology in Spain and Germany and Italy as you do in Scotland and England, you know? So how important was that for you to be able to go to a space like that and just express yourself? That whole trip was amazing because it was it was a South Lanarkshire Council facility and it was cheap as chips. You would go in, like finish school at three o'clock, you would go in there and you would rehearse from four o'clock to six o'clock. They had all the gear there. All you just had to do was like bring a guitar or whatever. They had a PA set up and it was like a really old school style room and they had posters from when Mogwai had played the venue up the stairs from where the rehearsal room was because obviously he's got bride band. Um, and it just seemed like that whole journey, like right through school and college, Snow, um, Snow Patrol or the the Stow College record label band when I was studying music at uni. Um, and say right the way through, like these giants of music have been there and they've obviously been supported by their surroundings and these rehearsal rooms and facilities put in place to allow them to express their creativity. And it's so important for them. Um, and it played a huge part in, in my early development as a musician, certainly. You mentioned Mogwai there. Uh, Kevin Graham and I just recorded a podcast, and it's the Scream of Celica one where Kevin picks a, an LP from his life. And we look at the LP, and we also look at what Celtic were doing at that time. It's a really good concept that he's come up with. He started it as an article, Kevin, but we now do it as a podcast. And uh, last night's album was won by Mogwai, which is a band. You know, I've kind of been into them for a long time. And we discussed it last night. And I says to Kevin, it's a band you need to invest in uh, because it can be quite challenging. It's not the kind of thing that you would put it on at a party and everybody would be up dancing to it. Or you know what I mean? You know that it's going to have a, a very niche market. When you were going to that rehearsal space and you seen the posters, were you think to yourself, you know, they guys have done it. They've been able to do it and they're from the same area and that might be an inspiration to someone like yourself. Exactly. And I mean, I think at that moment in time, it was nothing more than an inspiration because we were just down there making noise. But there's always that element at the back of your head where you know that, that they were in exactly the same position at some point. There may be more talented musicians or better songwriters, but everyone's got a chance if you knuckle down and work hard at it. Um, and they were an inspiration because they were a local band and we knew that they had been on the same journey that, that we hoped to go on. But without that confidence from an early age, then you, you don't have anything else. 
Um, you need to believe in yourself that you, you, you've got what it takes. And whether it was that band or a future incarnation of it, you are going to try and make a success of it in some way, shape or form. I think looking at your, your musical career, it's one thing that for one reason or other, and I think it was because we were really keen to get some acoustic tracks off you the last time we'd done the session in Stirling. We didn't really delve into the, the musical industry that you were involved in for so long. And you were at the sharp end. I mean, you were touring Europe. You were touring with big named bands, Kevin. Could you give us an idea into how you, you go from an aspiring musician like many other people in an unsigned band, if you like, to, to being the front man of a very successful touring band, releasing LPs and, and going on tour with some bands that might have been on posters on your bedroom wall a few months before? Yeah, I think um, we were very fortunate. When I joined Yashin, the band was already established, so they had a, a following in certain parts of the UK. They had a good following in Glasgow, Newcastle, Manchester, Leeds, like the main cities and then the singer left and they put out a call out for new vocalist and ended up getting the shout um, to join this band and as soon as I joined it was December 2008 and the band had already booked a European tour for winter 2009 so it was only in the door two minutes and we were writing a new album and we were going to be over to Europe to, to play but at the time it was exciting because I'd, I'd been in a job where I wasn't particularly enjoying myself um, and felt like I hadn't scratched an itch properly from playing in bands in my younger years that I wanted to like, try and pursue this as a career and had settled into a job and whatever else have you um, and decided this is what I wanted to do. So we got we got shipped out to like Germany and Italy for the band's first ever tour. And I think in hindsight, they probably did it to get us as far away from those protected territories as possible, like, like your Glasgow, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, because if we'd made an arse of it, they would probably just have put it down to a failed experiment and brought somebody else in if, if they didn't like the way it was going to go. Um, but it did work out and the rest was history. I think for aspiring bands coming up and playing local shows, you need to try and establish yourself as the biggest band of your genre in that particular city and use it as a bargaining chip to get yourself around the rest of the UK. Um, so we done it with Newcastle. There's a band called the Casino Brawl. Um, who we used to gig swap with and we would bring them up and we would play shows places like Ivory Blacks and then we'd go down there and play Newcastle's O2 Academy uh, and then London and Essex there was a band called Shadows Chasing Ghosts who done really well down there we brought them up to Glasgow they played to our fans we went back down there we played to their fans and, and if you're good enough and you have belief in your ability and your songwriting and your production people who hear you will come back and see you again and that's exactly what happened um, our big break was getting on a tour with a band called Medina Lake, an American band. And they were playing venues, probably about 1,000 to 1,200 cap all over the UK. And we got put on as the opener on this tour. And we just knew that if you put us in front of those fans for 20, 25 minutes every night, that we were going to capitalise on it. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and as soon as you get that one person in the industry who takes a liking to the band, you just you start to pick up a bit of traction from there. And obviously everybody comes back to the... Uh, Alan McGee, King Tut's Oasis story, you never know who's going to be there, but you genuinely don't know who's going to be at these shows. And it could have been one of the ones where we were playing to four people that someone was there and just happened to take a liking to us. And all of a sudden we're on TKO booking and we're out on tour with Papa Roach and Limp Biscuit playing with Corn, a day to remember, all over the UK and Europe. So um, things tend to escalate pretty quickly but you need to have that belief in yourself and that good quality production like poor recordings do, do your band no favours whatsoever um, and we went down to Longwave Studios in Cardiff to record with Ramesh um, so he'd recorded bands like Funeral for a Friend The Blackout Bullet for My Valentine so that's where we kind of wanted to be was like emulating that Welsh scene because it was so successful at the time um, and a good quality recording stood the band in such good stead moving forward and as soon as the first album was done the groundworks were there like we had a manager we had a booking agent we had a press agent everything was all there like the building blocks to, to make a success of Yashin and we just moved forward from there so <laughs> it sounds easy when you sort of break it down in like two or three minutes but we worked our arses off mate that the, the first year I think we played 70 shows and then in year two, 2010, we played nearly 100 gigs that year. So a show almost every sort of what, two to three days. Um, so it was grueling, like you're spending time away from your families, but 
at that point in time, we wouldn't have rather been anywhere else. That's exactly where we wanted to be, was on the road. Oh, definitely. It's interesting what you said there. It sounds easy when you break it down like that. And I think what happens is, for example, if, and this is completely different, but it's kind of my way of understanding it. If I'm doing an, an interview, I'll give you an example. I, I had a an event with Chris Sutton and it was up in Inverness and I had to pick Chris up in Glasgow and drive up to Inverness so it's a fair journey Kevin you know in the car and after about five minutes you check yourself because you're sitting chewing the fat with Chris Sutton a guy who played for a team that you you know were a season ticket holder watching and he seemed like a I mean he was an iconic player when Celtic signed him he was a an England internationalist golden boot winner part of the SAS and here he is just sitting there chewing the fat, answering his phone, replying to a few tweets. And you think to yourself, if someone had told me that, let's say, a year before, you'd have thought, no, nah, didn't he be daft? And it would have been quite a nervous kind of situation to throw yourself into. But when it eventually happens, because it's happened so slowly and in stages, it becomes almost natural, doesn't it? It's like, right, Kevin, uh, I want you to play in front of 1500 at the Royal Concert Hall. And you just went and done it. That's the, the the gig I'm talking about where you came along and you played live. And you, you seem very comfortable doing that. When you're playing to big, big audiences, Kevin, are you just very good at looking confident or is it something that you're quite natural at? There's definitely an element of game face there, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember, um, like, obviously, like you say, we, we went... I think when our, when our first album came out, it was early 2010 and it took probably a full year for the album to properly bed in before the big booking agent started to get in touch with us and offering us slots on those tours where we were out playing to two, three, four thousand people every night across UK and Europe. Um, so the Papa Roach tour was the first one and you go from doing your headline shows when you're playing like three or four hundred a night to ten times that. Um, and it's not your fans. So those those gigs that you and I done with Lennon and Sutton at the Royal Concert Hall where there's a thousand people there you know that the people there are going to be receptive to what you're doing but when you're there playing to somebody else's fans you don't know how it's going to work out we were so lucky that Papa Roach were accommodating of us Jacoby pulled us aside on the first date and he was just like look we want you to take as much from this tour as possible we want you to use as much of the stage there's no restrictions on how loud you can be if you want a backdrop speak to our stage hand and make sure they get it put up before you play like we want this to be an experience for you and I think bands at that level they've been they've been through the shite you know like they've, they've had to set up their drum kit in front of somebody else and there's been hostility and there's the, the stuff that happens when you're on tour like between bands and interband politics and everything else and they just they made us feel so comfortable so when you're sharing a hot food rider with the headline band on that tour it eases your you into the show later on that night rather than being like oh my god that guy those guys were a bunch of dicks to us earlier on and, uh, I, don't, I don't really feel too comfortable with this now it just made it so much easier for us and the fans were receptive and we done so well on that tour like Jacoby come up and done a tune with us we played in Sheffield and he come up and done like our new single at the times a song called Friends in High Places and he come up and sang it with us and it was just one of those defining moments of the band. Like you, as you said, their album artwork was up on my wall when I was fourteen years old, and it was incredible just to be on tour and and be peers with these guys and and they're friends for life now, Paul. You know, like they will still send us a message every now and again. Like apart from football, my other vice is cars, and one of the guys in Papa Roach is right in these cars, the hot rods and everything else. Um, and he'll, he'll drop me a message every now and again with with a car or what do you think of this Porsche or <laughs> blah 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 or Jacoby when they came back to Glasgow a few years ago we had arranged to meet up and go out for something to eat and I went to the Celtic store and I picked him up it was the 2014-2015 away kit mm-hmm. and I brought it into the, the meat bar in Glasgow and the two of us were sitting there with something I've got something for you mate and they produced this Celtic strip and he was like oh no way I'm going to wear this at the Barrowlands tonight and I was like mate you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> like this is not like a, this is not a one horse town. This is I tried to explain to him about the big like sectarian divide between the two clubs and he was just like, nah, it'll be fine, like the show's sold out, people won't care. And he didn't wear it and then he went off stage for the encore and he came back on wearing like the yellow and green Magnus. The right. yellow with the thin green stripes. And um the place was just kicked off. It was booze and cheers and it was just nuts like <laughs> to think that this guy who was an idol of mine's growing up was cutting about in the Barrowlands wearing a Celtic strip because I'd given it to him as, as oh, a gift. Brilliant. It's quite interesting that you've told that story because somebody sent me a link to Big Audio Dynamite and it was Mick Jones and he was playing on French television and he's wearing the Celtic away strip. Now it was a few years before the gig you're talking about, it was the C.R. Smith one and it was yellow 
with the kind of you know the Space Invaders look. Yeah, it was, yep. uh, and Mick Jones is wearing it, and we're trying to figure out why on earth he was wearing a Celtic top. He's not one of the obvious kind of Celtic names, you know, in the in the rock and roll world. But you tried your best, Kevin. You told the guy not to wear it at the bars, and he just went away and done it, you know. I know, and uh, he phoned me uh, maybe about five or six months after that show, and. I think I'd sent him a text. It was the was it the first? I think we'd played Aberdeen in either the league or the Scottish Cup final that year. And um, he phoned me to say, "I'm out for a jog. I'm wearing that Celtics jersey. <laughs> How did your team go on today?" I know it's great that people continue to introduce others to Celtic through. You know, I think it was uh, Gianni Capaldi was on the podcast last week and he was doing that. Everybody met Danny Glover, right? He's getting a Celtic scarf, you know, or he's getting a Celtic top. I think that's brilliant. Keep spreading the word. Martin Comston does it as well. So you've got like Kiefer Sutherland bouncing about in Celtic strips. It's tremendous. But I mean, the big thing as well with, with regards to music and musicians, I always think, Kevin, there comes a point, even the biggest musicians in the world, they put everything on the line. Every single musician takes the biggest risk you could imagine. I mean, I I think back to any band that's got a job, a mortgage, a wife, kids, whatever. You've got to basically put everything at risk just to go for that one chance at at making it in in the music industry. Did you see any of the kind of more ruthless side of the industry? Did it ever get a bit grisly? It was once called by Ian Brown, the filthiest business in the universe. I mean, did you see any of that side of things yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think aside from taking that plunge. I mean, the decision-making on behalf of the band has such an impact on the band's life. Obviously, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. And uh, I remember we went to the Kerrang Awards in 2012 and um, the band had made the decision that we were going to go down. I mean, you're talking this is like the biggest sort of alternative music event in the UK. Um, Ozzy Osbourne was going to be there, Tony Iommi, Jack Black was doing his Tenacious D thing at the time. He was going to be there. Um, bands like Machine Head and just crazy. Like Dizzy Rascal was sat at our table with one of the guys from Good Charlotte and we'd made this decision we're going to go down wearing kilts and like mm-hmm. do like the, the, the Scottish thing. And uh, I remember saying to the boys, I'm going to wear my kilt, but I want to wear, it was the black 125th anniversary away strip, the one with the, the tricolour and the, the roll-ups and the sleeves. Right. And uh, I remember one of the boys, the band was split, Celtic fans and Rangers fans, and one of the boys had grasped me into the management and the next minute I got a phone call. Kevin, we, we heard that you're talking about wearing a Celtic strip to the Kananga Awards and you need to really have a think about this because like, if you like, nail your colours to the mast at this stage, you're going to alienate half of your biggest market, which is Glasgow, whether you like it or not. And I had to take a long, hard look at myself and think about whether I wanted to jeopardise the band's career through a personal choice mm-hmm. um, and ended up wearing just like a, I think it was just like a polo shirt, a Fred Perry or something like that, or, or, or rather than wearing the Celtic strip. But... That was a moment of realisation for me that the decisions that I made had such a big effect on the other five guys who were in the band who'd sacrificed everything to be where we were. But we made right decisions and wrong decisions, Paul. Like The first album put us on a pedestal and then the second album was a self-release and eclipsed what we'd achieved the first time around. And I think we probably we probably left it too long for the third album. Uh, we messed around with demos, didn't like them, went somewhere else to re-record them. And then eventually we got a bit of major label interests sniffing around us and after a long drawn out negotiation process sony music released our third album but by that point like music industry is so fickle people move on so quickly and by the time our third album was ready for release i think everyone who had been there for the second album had found a shiny new toy and they weren't really interested in what we had to do at that moment in time so i it is totally cutthroat and i remember the label coming in and um we had presented the album as as we saw it as we wrote those songs as we recorded them and they came in and they were saying like we don't like that second verse uh, can you make make it the same phonetics as the first verse but change the lyrics uh, we don't like that middle eight it's too long cut it in half and they basically tried to radio edit every single one of the songs on the album and that was soul destroying mate because you put everything into those tunes mm-hmm. um, and to have somebody come in and rip them to bits and sew them back together again for the purposes of commercial success was difficult to take. Oh, that sounds so destroying. And when the band finally decided, Kevin, that it was it was the end, how difficult was that then to come back to what you would call normal life? We were talking about what it's going to be like going back to normality after the, the lockdown. And, you know, it's going to be a welcome return to normality. But if you've been on such a high and touring big venues with big bands. Was it difficult to then come back to normality after that? It was a difficult decision to take in the first place because 
I think when we, the band had been going for eight years at that point. We started, I joined the band in 2008 and we chucked it in December 2016. So it was, yeah, eight years. And um, when we made the decision, what happened was we, we, we released the album and then the label put us out to go on tour with a, an American band. And the deal was that they were going to reciprocate and give us a return leg in America. Um, and we put the UK tour together, announced it, got it released, the tour poster went out, pre-sales were, were all available, and then we got word that the American leg of the tour wasn't going to materialise, and it was just like, you know, what is the point here? And I always remember in, in the early days of the band, we'd been, we'd been on tour in Europe, and there was a band called Hawthorne Heights. You can look these guys up, you probably don't recognise the name, but in maybe 2004 or 2005, they were shot to Insta Stardom in America. They were like a, an emo kind of band. Uh, they had a massive album that was like Billboard Top 40 single. And we played a show with them in Europe, maybe 2011, 2012. And for us, it was great because it was maybe like 150 tickets sold for this show, which at that time for us was amazing. And uh, I remember seeing this band sat backstage and they were just on Skype to their wives and kids and families back home. And it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been sustainable for them. There's no way they were making enough money to, to be out on tour. But for us at that stage in our careers, we would have jumped in the van for six cans of lager and went anywhere in the world. But when you reach that point in your life, I found myself looking at them and thinking, what's in it for them? They're clearly not enjoying it because they're all sitting here with their faces tripping them. Um, and there's not enough people here for it to be a viable option to keep touring. And I just said to myself at that point, when we reach that stage, this is finished. I don't ever want to be that band that's touring just for the sake of it because we don't have anything else. And I had other aspirations. I had things I wanted to do. Like me and my wife were still, we were married, but we were still living in rented digs. Uh, Debbie was like subsidizing my lifestyle. She was working her ass off to pay the bills because I wasn't making any money in the band. And I just decided, we sat down with the boys and we thought rather than doing this tour, which is fruitless for us, we weren't getting to America out of it. We weren't, didn't stand to gain anything from it. We're just going to do two shows, one in London, one in Glasgow and draw a line under it while we, while we still had some pride um, mm. and, and we could walk away from it with our heads held high. And that's exactly what we did. Big decision. But I mean, Kevin, I didn't realise it was right up to 2016 because quite quickly you came back with your own release and it was a completely different style of music. But it captured the imagination of Celtic fans to such a point, and I've, I've mentioned this to you before, that other people sing your song in Boozers in Glasgow on match day. I mean, in terms of writing a song and putting it out there, that's one thing. But when it actually enters the modern day Celtic songbook, that must be huge for you. I mean, you've heard it, haven't you? You've heard other people singing it. It's nuts, man. I heard Danny Kelly on Celtic State of Mind doing a, doing a version of it. Um, but it opened me up to a whole new world, Paul. Like that circuit that people do with ex-pros and people coming along to, to talk to people in conversation like yourself and... Uh, guys like Liam McGrandles, who that's their livelihood at the end of the day, you know, it opened me up to a world of incredibly talented musicians that I hadn't previously been exposed to through the type of music that we were playing with Yashin and these incredible musicians, singers and songwriters um, that are doing it day in, day out. Um, so it, it was wild for me and it was something, it was a huge departure from where I'd been with Yashin and, and a metal band and um, it was just something that I'd always wanted to do but just couldn't find the subject matter to put something out there and and in my mind's eye for it to be credible like it could be so easy to just kind of like throw together like all your favorite things about Celtic and put it into a tune but it's not going to necessarily come out in the right manner and people like writing me messages in social media and oh are you going to write another song and what about an album and stuff like that but I think it needs to come to you and, and for it to have credence and be genuine otherwise you're just churning out shite for the sake of it so I think for me to just do one song and for it to have received the reception that it did was amazing. And to hear it played at Celtic Park and to be able to do those events with like Chris Sutton and Neil Lennon, uh, Tom Boyd and Simon Donnelly, the, the big party down in Greenup uh, for the anniversary of stopping the 10. And it's just amazing, mate. Like It was a totally different experience from what I got in Yashin, but it was so fulfilling at the same time. No, it's, it's been great. It's been great to share a stage with you and, and watch you from the side of the stage as well. And, and just see how well received that song 
and you as, as a musician are as well, Kevin. But I mean, the Celtic state of mind thing has always been, we talk about Celtic, but we talk to people with a Celtic state of mind. And I remember one person criticising us because he had listened to one of our podcasts for 20 minutes and we hadn't mentioned Celtic yet. But that's possible when you're talking to somebody who's a Celtic fan or got a link to Celtic. It just, you know, it doesn't necessarily always have to be talking about the last game or the next game. And what I like to do is I like to ask people, it's a topical thing, about their, their greatest ever Celtic 11. And this is a team, Kevin, that you've seen 1-11. to 11. You know, sometimes it might not even be the best players, but someday that you had an affinity with, some, you know, sometimes makes it into the into the team. Could you talk us through your greatest Celtic 11, 1-11, to 11, and give us some reasons why? Mate, I just, uh, I don't know whether this is uh, something that should see there, but obviously you gave me a heads up about this question and gave me a bit of time. It's probably the worst thing that could have happened because... I've changed it about 40 times since she, since she texted me. I think, for me, this is a team made up of Celtic players who I've seen in my lifetime. My goalkeeper is Fraser Forster. Now, I don't know whether I'm maybe just clouded by recent performances because he's been absolutely unplayable since he came back, but he was like that first time around. It was a toss-up between Forster and Boric. Obviously, the, the big man had a bit more of a personality, but... I think just in terms of what he's brought this season in particular, I can't think of a better goalkeeper that I've seen since I've been there. Going to go for a 4-4-2. So you've got Jackie McNamara, Johan Mialbe, Virgil van Dijk and Kieran Tierney as my back four. Again, I had a battle with myself between Jackie McNamara and Enrico Anoni. had a soft spot for the big man <laughs> back in the day. Um, but I think Jackie Mack edged it uh, for the assist on the, the day we stopped the 10. My midfield four is Shutsuki Nakamura, Scott Brown, Lubo Moravchik and Scott Sinclair. Maybe a bit controversial, but I, I think Sinclair on his day is as good as anyone we've had in that position since I've been alive and is probably a victim of his own success in that first season because he was just incredible. I think if he came and played the way he played in his second season, people wouldn't have looked down on him at that stage. He was still producing the goods. The amount of goals that he contributed yeah. was just incredible. And my two up top, like there's just so many people, players <laughs> missing for this team, but... I picked Larson and Moussa Dembele. Um, I think in a season's time, Edouard's probably going to have eclipsed Dembele, but at the time, Dembele was the best striker that I'd seen at Celtic since watching Henrik Larson. So there's my living. And my gaffer um, was another toss-up between uh, my heart ruling my head and... It was between Tommy Burns and Martin O'Neill and I picked Tommy Burns because the Scottish Cup final in 1995 probably meant more to me than... Martin O'Neill's treble winning side or the team that got to Seville uh, and I, I would have loved to have seen him managing that particular team I think he'd have got the best out of every single one of those players There's so many players in your team that were in my team I was asked this probably about a month ago now Kevin and I had to think about it because of the Dembele and Eduard thing they had obviously come in. I had a team written a few years back and Frank McAvenny was partnering Henrik Larson. And then I realised there's no way I can't have Dembele. And then, after last season, there's no way I, I can't have Eduard. So I changed my formation and everything just to accommodate them. But the, the one thing that probably wasn't the obvious is that I also chose Tommy Burns as my manager. And I, I said at the time, I know he's not the most successful manager and he probably isn't the best manager, but he's my favourite, personal favourite manager. And the interesting thing you said there uh, about Forster and Boric, we have been spoiled over the last few years because you could throw Gordon in there as well for a, a spell. I know. Tommy Burns never had that. He never had that goalie, did he? When you think about it, you know, and how many points would we have gained if we didn't have Gordon Marshall in goals? And you know, fair play to Big Packy. He played a few games, probably that he didn't expect. He, Burns wanted him more as a an old head. He'd actually been freed. He was meant to be going to Kilmarnock, and he went to the USA World Cup Finals with Republic of Ireland as a free agent, which is I think he was the only player in the tournament that didn't have a club. And you know, when the names come up on the screen, and it might have been Ray Houghton, Aston Villa, Pat Bonner, unattached. You know, and it was like bloody. I think he was the only player, but then Burns brought him back in, and. Um, I think it was a good decision, but I don't think Burns had that goalie. If he had had a, a Craig Gordon type, Boric, Forster, history would have been completely different, Kevin. But I also had Tommy Burns, you know. I don't regret that, and it's not going to change. I mean, I've watched Martin O'Neill, Neil Lennon, who I love, Brendan Rodgers, who, as a coach and a manager, if you forget all the other bullshit that came afterwards, three brilliant managers that I've seen in my lifetime. But Tommy Burns, I would still have 
uh, Tam every single time. You mentioned Sinclair as well. Great point. Imagine he played the second season and his first season. People would have been happy with that contribution, but he put his, his level so high. And one thing I was going to mention, but I forgot, you, you released the single, but you were also in that iconic image, Kevin, where you're kind of throwing your, your body over to celebrate the Invincible treble. And I keep saying, I've mentioned this a few times on the podcast, that picture will be shown in 50 years' time. You know what I mean? In 50 years' time when they're showing that Invincible treble, there is Kevin Miles diving over to celebrate. I mean, that's brilliant. I think you've got it in a big canvas, haven't you? Mate, it was actually my, my brother got Geo Thompson to paint it. Um, and they took it up to Lennox Town and Willie McStay um, got all the players to sign it. Um, so you can imagine all the stuff that ends up at Lennox Town for people to sign for like charity dues and other bits and pieces. And it's just a kind of like they see like a strip that's going to get framed every day. But for this painting to appear, uh, it was just something a wee bit different. And Willie said like the players were all over it. Like, oh, look, check this out. And it's signed and uh, it's up in my brother's house. Um, so it was amazing. It was an out of body experience that at that moment in time. I don't know where I summoned the energy. Like obviously it wasn't the most attractive of games that we'd played that season. Um, we sat thinking, is this going to be our day for large periods of that game? And if you watch, there's actually a bit of footage. Um, if you go into like the William Hill website, my brother pointed out to me there's a bit of footage and someone has put the Titanic <laughs> theme music over the top of it, um, and you just you see it cuts. And it's, I stand up as soon as Roger gets on the ball and obviously you can tell that I think something something amazing is going to happen. And my dad and my brother are sat beside me and the two of them are just sat there obviously just <laughs> depressed and don't think anything's going to materialise from it. And as soon as the ball hit the back of the net, I, I stood on the back of the seat in front of me and I must have vaulted four or five rows to reach that space between the, the front row and the barrier. And before I knew it, I'd... Like pulled myself up on top of the guy in front of me, and <laughs> I had Stuart Armstrong in a headlock. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was amazing. What an experience! Just a whole day, and I ended up I went home and came back into the town after it, and don't really remember much of it. And the next day was the day that I started writing the Celtic song. It just sort of came to me like a vision. <laughs> it fueled. It certainly fueled the fire. And I, I seen your image on that picture before I met you, before I, I heard the single, before. You were on the podcast, and it's a great iconic image, and I'm delighted that you've you've managed to get it captured by Geo. And uh, when when we talk about great Celtic teams, another thing that I mentioned time and time again on this podcast, and I think it's probably because I'm scarred from the early nineties when we spent a lot of money. We spent a lot of money, and we didn't get much in return for what we were shelling out. When there were so many other great players out there who you thought to yourself, as a Celtic man, he would do the job better. The big examples I always throw out is, we brought in Tony Casker, you know Kevin, for 1.1. We could have had Bernie Slavin. Bernie Slavin, who ended up as a Republic Island international, and scored for fun down in England. He tried to force through a move to Celtic by coming up to Celtic Park whilst a Middlesbrough player, and getting some guy for the, the press that he knew to take a picture of him in front of Celtic Park with a scarf above his head, the green and white scarf, come and get me, you know, didn't it happen, for the 1.1 million we could have probably got Bernie Slavin for about 600 grand, for the 1.5 that we shelled out for Stuart Slater, we could have had Pat Nevin for 300 grand, he went from Everton to Tranmere Rovers for 300 grand, and these are guys that would have been Celtic players like proper Celtic men, is there anybody through your Celtic support in life that you thought he's going to be a Celtic player? But he never ever did, and that was just through maybe your own inability to see that the guy was was good enough, or we didn't offer enough money, or we just didn't actually go for him. I don't know, man. I think it's maybe um, I was maybe a victim of uh, a generation that grew up without an alternative media outlet. You know, um, everything that I seen was in the papers or in the Celtic View or whatever else, um, and. I played a bit of championship manager when I was younger on the PC. Me and my brother used to uh, used to take it pretty seriously. What um, a, what a and that was. I know it was the it was the championship manager at two with the ninety seven ninety eight season update. Um, and my first signing in that game was always Georgie Kincladze from Man City. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember in the early Martin O'Neill days there was paper talk about Kincladze coming to Celtic, and it was always a buzz like for someone who'd done well for you and your champ man save <laughs> to be speculated to be coming to Celtic. And I think it got pretty close at the time um, and just didn't materialise and, and didn't get things over the line. But I'd love to have seen him play for Celtic. Um, and then you obviously get the <laughs> the, the stories about um, apparently we were going to sign Giroud before he moved to Chelsea and <laughs> didn't materialise. It would have been Giroud and Samaras up front, the best looking strike partnership in the history of football. <laughs> 
um, but just didn't quite get there. But yeah, I think Kincladsey for me would probably have been the guy that I'd have wanted to have seen. I remember seeing it all over the back pages of the paper. Again, it was one of those come and get me sort of pleased that they went out at that time. But just one of those things, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, obviously people talk about Celtic-minded individuals and guys like James McLean come up in conversation quite regularly, but he is Celtic to the core, but would he improve on the players that we've got just now? And we need to differentiate between the two, I think. Um, it'd have been great to have guys there that were playing for the jersey and whatever else have you, but sometimes it just takes somebody to come with no understanding of it whatsoever. I love Amir Moravchik, who, when he played against Rangers in, in that 5-1 game that was on the telly, <laughs> on the highlights not too long ago, when he scores that first goal, he has absolutely no idea of what he's just done. He doesn't have any concept of what's happening around about him. The place is going off. And he's just kind of like looking around as if, what have I let myself in for here? And the players are going mental around about him. But like his lack of understanding of how much it means to us probably stood him in better stead in the long term, uh, rather than somebody coming in and knowing what it was about. And I always find Griffiths is like that as well. Do you ever see uh, when Griffiths comes on as a sub, he tries too hard and he makes mistakes and he snatches at chances and bits and pieces like because he, he wants it so bad. Uh, whereas somebody who's disconnected from it, like Fergus McCann talking about it, I don't want somebody coming in that's that knows what this is about. I need to bring somebody in who's disconnected from it to make sure that they're they're not clouded in their judgment and trying to make the best decisions moving forward for the club. I think you're right, and I think that's why he, he appointed Vim Janssen, and it worked out just perfectly well. You were talking about playing for the jerseys, Kevin. I know that you like a match worn jersey, you like a bit of memory bill. You what are your two favourite Celtic strips home and away for this Celtic eleven team that you've picked? Um I think I was torn from my early memories of Celtic strips that I loved. But I think for me, in its purest form, the fortieth anniversary of Lisbon strip, I think it was two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. I've got it in a long sleeve and it's just it's a night kit and it's just absolutely perfect. It's like the hoops are the right size and it's just a, a nicely made kit like some of the, the the later New Balance ones just feel a bit flimsy and it doesn't have the embroidered crest and for me that was just the perfect home strip of my generation mm-hmm. and for the away kit I think I was a bit sort of torn as well um, between the first Bumblebee kit which I've got great memories of the likes of Paolo up at Pataudry with the gold boots on in Boxing Day and then the other side to that was the, the strip that I wanted to wear at the Kerrang Awards was the the black 125th anniversary with the Kraken. with the tri colour and the and the oh. sleeves that would, that would be my choice those, those two. Oh, absolutely! I I mean that that black I like a black away kit. I've got to say, Kevin, I do like Celtic playing in black, and um, people might think there's not much you can do with it, but we've had some cracking black away jerseys. I love the Bumblebee kit first time round as well. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to the Adidas strips when when they come out, Kevin. I mean. When it comes down to Celtic, though, I just don't understand how no one's produced the big baggy shorts with the big green numbers on it. Because God Almighty, they, you would see them all over, all over cheap package holidays once we are allowed to leave the country. That is, that you is. know, so, so much of the concept art that's been doing the rounds, like with the Adidas kits, like Boca Juniors had an amazing away kit last year, uh, and it was kind of reminiscent of that. Um, what was it you called it? The um, the shocker. The, the the sort of the the Celtic finances yeah, for the early nineties, the graph abomination. going down the way, the right. abomination, yeah. But someone's done a, like a, a sort of concept art Photoshop version of Edward wearing that strip in those ninety one ninety two colours, the the Boca Juniors template, and it just looks amazing. But if they listen to what people are saying, they can't get it wrong. Like, what's wrong with just simple green and white hoops, three stripes on the sleeve, nice and simple. It can't possibly go wrong, but you know fine well that this will have been done for a long time and they'll have something in production already, which may or may not reflect what the fans actually want. But I'm I'm excited. I like Adidas, and it's obviously something new for us and moving forward. Don't get me wrong. Let's see the um, the 50th anniversary of Lisbon strip, the, the, the New Balance kit with the gold, the alphabet. That was an incredible strip, good design, but... Again, it just didn't feel like that night quality that came with the, the, the previous kit supplier. It just kind of, it was a great design, but just the, the quality of it was a bit of a letdown. Bizarrely enough, you mentioned about getting the fan engagement, and I think I'm amazed that, that clubs don't do it more often. Uh, but I do remember Kevin Graham, my cohort on a Celtic State of Mind, he actually attended one of these meetings. He was invited as part of the affiliation. And New Balance were talking, Kevin, about the possibility of releasing a blue Celtic change kit because they had done some kind of marketing research and they reckoned it would be a big seller in America and everybody in the room was just looking at them as, as if to say you're having a laugh you know and they were actually considering 
a blue away kit, a pink away kit, and a brown away kit, and obviously they've gone for the pink one. But to even have that as a consideration shows how far removed sometimes people are. And I think there was a there was a rumor that Nike wanted to do away with the hoops near the end of their tenure as the kit manufacturers. But I'm like yourself, I'm looking forward to the, the Adidas kits. Were you into the fanzine culture when you started going to the games? Did you pick up the fanzines and the sack the board stuff and all that, or were you a wee bit younger? I think I was maybe a bit late to the party for that. I remember my dad having having fanzines up in the loft, which I used to pick my way through when I was younger, but without any real understanding of what was going on. He used to have fanzines and like badges that he'd bought off stalls outside the stadium. I always remember he had a badge that said, eh, I'm not biased. I don't care who beats the Huns on a, on a badge that was attached to an old scarf that was that was stored up in the loft. Um, but no, I think I was a bit late to the party with the, with the fanzines. Probably too young for it when it was around. And by the time I started going to Celtic Park, like maybe missed the boat on it slightly and uh, didn't didn't quite get involved on it and, and skipped that phase and went straight to like message boards and social media. It was a big thing. It was a big thing for me, Kevin, because I do remember, you know, my first game was 1987 and you see the centenary year, you think, oh, this is great being a Celtic fan. But then you quickly realise it's not like that all the time. And then you go through years and years of nothing. And I was a big fan of Not The View, but I remember like the older generation and the Celtic supporters bus that I... I went to the games and and they were they were buying all of these fanzines, everything that was for sale, and a lot of them were kind of Irish publications as well. Kevin, you know, talking about Ireland and the fight for freedom, and they were sitting there and they were reading them like Bibles. And you you learn from a young age that the Celtic view wasn't the be all and end all, and obviously not the view called it Pravda, just a propaganda vehicle, uh, which is bizarre because later on when you're releasing books and you're working alongside the club to release books and stuff, you know, you've got to, to toe the party line and, and kind of appear and, and do interviews in the Celtic view in places like that, but you were kind of a rebel back in the day. I don't think it's as bad now, but not the view for me was brilliant because it was so influential in voicing the opinions of people like uh, the Save Ourselves group. We've had a a couple of the guys, Willie Wilson and Jim Orr on the podcast and later on Celts for Change with Matt McGlone and Brendan Sweeney and these guys. And the fanzines were your go-to, that was your Bible and it kept everybody informed, very important kind of street movement. But it was also hilariously funny. And there was a there was a section on the back and it was called The Embarrassed the Hoops. Now we actually interviewed the average Joe Miller, so-called because he didn't want to be mistaken for Super Joe Miller who won the Scottish Cup in 1989. And he said they used to get so much stick for having the audacity to slag off somebody that played for Celtic. But at the end of the day, Kevin, not everybody that plays for Celtic does the job, right? And particularly in the early 90s, man, there were so many of them that could have been part of that feature. I've asked a lot of people this question on the podcast that refused to answer it. So I have to edit it out. Is there... Is there a player that you think would have been good for the embarrass the hoops? I think um, I think you need to make a distinction between players who embarrass the hoops and then players who come in with this air of expectancy to do well and had a price tag associated with it and it maybe didn't materialise for them. And the, the one that I remember from growing up was, was a Brazilian superstar, Rafael Scheidt. And the, oh, the name yes. probably screams it all. Um, I just remember getting absolutely tortured off the boys I played football with at the time, Rangers fans. I can't believe he signed a guy called Shite. And then he lived up to his name. Nearly five million quid, I think, for this guy. We were stitched up like a kipper. Just brutal. Like the, the, the price tag was never justified. And I think we went through a number of players like that who we brought in in their twilight years and they were expected to come in and rule the roost, like say your Ian Wrights and stuff like that, that just didn't ever do it. And, <laughs> Those are the guys that if I was editor at Not The View back then would probably have made that feature. Aye, aye. You mentioned shite and again I was scared with that because the money that we spent but Not The View were great. You mentioned Danone before and I think I, I first heard of that that uh, immortal line, oh no, no Anone, I know, no. And I, I read that in Not The View but they also told the story about us being interested in signing Davy Weir and our bat line would have been Weir Tebley, shite, because we had uh, Oliver Tebley as well. So shite would definitely have made the, the back page of the Not The View without a shadow of a doubt. And I don't mind. I mean, Kevin, if a player doesn't do the business, you, you're allowed to criticise him. Just because he played with Celtic, you can still criticise him, you know. Ian Wright, when he, when he came up, and there's been so many more uh, like him. I mean, Marvin Compere, he just conned a living. One game. 
I think he played 60 minutes. You know, that, that kind of thing, I think as, as fans, you can't be a sycophant, you can't say everybody's great and it's always rosy in the garden. If, if somebody needs criticise, you've got to pull them up for it, you know? But obviously, in recent years, it's been completely different and there's been far fewer, I would suggest, players who would have appeared in that Not The View feature. Now, Definitely, now, I had to things, cast my mind back to... <laughs> to pick a few of them out. We've been spoiled recently. Oh, we have. I mean, we have been spoiled. But then, I look at uh, even Martin O'Neill and uh, the rumour that O'Neill took Raphael Scheich's squad number 31 uh, and basically said there's more chance of me playing for Celtic than him, so I'm going to take his squad number and he started wearing the number 31 on his top and he wore it <laughs> throughout his career afterwards. <laughs> If that, even if it's not true, I'm going to say it is true. And I can't even remember who told me that, but it's a great story. Kevin Graham is somebody that you've seen. You've seen him doing his poetry and, and stuff like that as well, Kevin. And he's he's very much... I remember the first time I met Kevin and he turned up wearing a, a Michael Head t-shirt. And I thought to myself, he'll be all right for me because he's such an obscure musician that I was into. And if somebody else is into it, then I know that I'm going to get on with this guy. And he does Scream a Celica. And I love it. It's a really, really good podcast. It's like a standalone podcast where he picks an LP out of his collection and then we talk about the times uh, of that LP. And it can take us back any any era. What were Celtic doing at that time? And what other music was happening at that time? Is there a particular LP in your lifetime, and you've been involved in the industry, that, you know, it was kind of like, you keep going back to it. It's one of your favourite all-time albums. I think for me, my favourite album is called A Will of Fire, and it's by a band called Asriel, and they were a Glasgow hardcore band. Um, And I think this album came out in maybe 2008, and I just, when I first heard it, I couldn't believe that this band were from Glasgow, and it's maybe a bit inaccessible for the majority of the listeners. It's probably a bit on the heavy side for, for the majority, but for me, it was just incredible musicianship and just pure passion coming out of this band. The the words were incredible. The music was just unbelievable. Um, and it just captured me. And I ended up getting the album artwork tattooed on my right arm as, as a as a sleeve. The full thing was, the artist was a guy called Dan Mumford. And I got the full sleeve tattooed maybe around about 2011, 2012. And the band ended up, we took them out on tour um, in 2012. On when we done our second album, they came out on 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 our We Created a Monster tour, and I always remember we played in a venue in Preston, a headline show, uh, on the seventh of November two thousand and twelve. And Asriel had arrived on the back of a recovery truck because their van broke down on the way there, and they came in and we sat in the dressing room, and it was just like we'd sound checked, they'd missed their sound check, they were just getting ready to go on, and it was the night that we played Barcelona at Celtic Park, so. Mm-hmm. They were all big Celtic fans and we sat in the dressing room that night and had a drink and it was just fateful, mate, honestly, um, to be there with this band that I had grew up watching and they were out su- supporting <laughs> my band. It was just incredible. Um, and there they were, sat in the dressing room, big Celtic fans watching this iconic night take place before our eyes. Um, but that was a that was a big miss when I was in the band. Like you're talking about being away in Europe and trying to find a Celtic supporters, not even a Celtic supporters club, just somewhere that would show the game. Like driving around Germany, like asking pubs if they would show the Celtic game. No, not here. And you're on like before the days where you could go on and like find a a, a hooky stream, like nice as you like. That was difficult, and you were trying to like sitting on your phone and clicking away a million adverts to just try and watch the game. But that for me was. A defining album and I always come back to it. It's not dated in any way, shape or form. It stood the test of time. So I that that's that's my favourite album and that's its link to my career and Celtic probably. It just has Celtic. good memories for me. I'm gonna to have to check it out as well. And it it must have been a real thrill obviously for a band that you were so invested in that you would actually get the artwork tattooed on your on your arm and then they're supporting you I mean that's just incredible Kevin that's brilliant it's great it's like a coming of age moment and you're just sitting there watching Celtic beating the best club side in the world with this band (laughs) that's brilliant I love it now we're talking about how you were on the road and it might have been difficult to tap into Celtic and then obviously absence makes the heart grow fonder and we've been learning that time and time again over the last six seven weeks and it's been difficult through isolation for so many different reasons Kevin how's things going to change when we get back to football I mean I done a podcast uh, probably four or five weeks ago now with David Lowe and uh, I think the rest of the Axon guys thought I was a prophet of doom because I was basically saying there's going to be four or five clubs left in Scotland so talking about reconstruction I don't think there's going to be a Scottish league that Celtic can play in I honestly see a silver lining if you can describe it as that in that Celtic will have to 
to move on and play elsewhere. I honestly can't see Scottish football surviving this. And the big, so-called big clubs, in inverted commas, such as the one currently playing out at Ibrox, who tell me that's not the evidence that they're going to be presenting to the SPFL, Kevin. Because if so, it's been the best wind-up of the banter years. Have you been following yes. that on Twitter? Did I, you? I did. It's one of the boys. I only found out about it maybe an hour or two ago, Paul. And one of the boys sent in, and I got so heavily invested in it. I, I was looking through. There's there's a thread of of the reaction and all the the Rangers uh, sort of alternative media outlets that have been posting it with vigor <laughs> and uh, and seeing the replies to that. And it, it's one of the most elaborate wind-ups of, like you say, the banter years. I mean, it goes straight to the top. It, it leapfrogs the, the the AGM in a tent on the park at Ibrox. You know, it's it's up there with the ball on top of the hedge and stuff like that. Quite incredible, but I really hope that that is what Douglas Park sat and, and read through and, and took at face value. And it was a wind-up, somebody photoshopping. Uh, I mean, for Dundee to be doing their accounts in QuickBooks for a start and for for somebody at his stature to be falling for it. I really hope that is the the race, the, the race up their sleeve, <laughs> and that's what they had. But I don't know, man. It's just I think obviously you're the prophet of doom and want to tell us that it's we're playing and going to end up playing in a five team league. We'll maybe end up getting Celtic and my five or side team on a Tuesday night up at Playsport in East Kilbride. Um But I don't know. Maybe a bit of blind positivity on my part, but I think from my perspective, we're maybe starting to see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, I've got friends through my career in the band who are involved in the music industry that make a living out of mass gatherings of people who are really, really struggling just now. And they're talking about that not resuming again until January 2021. And I don't know how we're going to sustain that length of time away from the football, but it's just hard for, for me to look at that and take it with any degree of seriousness when compared to the fact that I've not seen my nephews in six or seven weeks now and they're only two and not even one yet and I'm missing such a huge part of their upbringing. My youngest nephew's starting to like roll on his front and be crawling about and we're just missing so much of it. I would love to see the season played out, but I just can't fathom how it's going to happen. PSG have obviously been crowned champions tonight, but from our perspective, we had a semi-final to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially another treble and I feel like the rug's been swept out from underneath us and that opportunity's been taken away from us, but for anybody to say that we're not here on merit, is just ludicrous. I'm usually quite active on my Twitter and my social media, but this has just put things into perspective for me and I'm trying to use my time to get fit. Uh, my wife's been making headbands for the NHS uh, to stop like the face masks cutting in behind the ears. And uh, I'm just looking to try to restore a bit of normality into my life and when Celtic can be a part of that again. The thing is, Kevin, you're absolutely spot on. And, you know, we, we get so kind of blinkered when we're doing podcasts and stuff, and they're talking about Celtic and what the future holds and stuff like that. But the real important thing is exactly what you've described there. And there's people on the front line who are struggling on a daily basis. Just a wee bit of self-disclosure, because this is bizarre as much as it's interesting. But my wife works for the NHS, and she was showing symptoms of the coronavirus. So we organised to get a, a test done, and we had to drive through Edinburgh Airport. Now, this was a scene at a movie, Kevin. This was like apocalyptic. So you're driving up, you're not allowed to open your windows, right? And you're driving up basically, what would you call it, a runway, a runway at the airport, and it's all coned off. And you're coming up to people in suits who are actually communicating like Bob Dylan out of Subterranean Homesick Blues. It's just nobody's talking to you. They're trying to get you to remove your your dash cam, which is fixed onto your windscreen. And it, it is a strange situation. And then you get your swab and all this, and it's like, wow. This was like, it was like, it was horrible. It was actually a horrible experience. And then you've got... Sounds some... like uh, Independence Day, driving up to Area 51, Paul. Exactly. It was. i seen brilliant pictures on Twitter the day about people going, uh, like a drive through a uh, strip joint. And <laughs> it was just bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> and the descriptions <laughs> and the comments on it. And it was like, we are entering that stage. You know what I mean? Where it's just the apocalypse. And, uh, you know, Armageddon and Scottish football... Doesn't really register on on the, the great scheme of things. Thankfully, uh, the results came back negative. But there's people like you're saying, your your good lady, they are doing some sterling work to try and assist them because they're not being given good enough equipment uh, on the front line. And you know when they're wearing it for this period of time, they're coming home with blisters on their face, Kevin. You know because they're they're, they're sweating buckets underneath. And when you see people flaunting it 
uh, and you see a lot of that on, on Twitter, it's infuriating because I have been more or less in my house for six or seven weeks and uh, dropped off shopping to my in-laws, dropped off shopping to my parents. But I'm like yourself, you think, right, it's an opportunity to clear the decks, uh, get a wee bit fitter and all that kind of stuff. And then you, you see mass gatherings on Twitter and all this kind of stuff. It's really frustrating. And I just hope that, you know, there's so many industries that are going to, to really be hit hard and are being hit hard by that football being one of them. The big thing, obviously, with football as well, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, is a home game at Celtic is worth a million pounds to the Scottish economy. You know, a sellout at Celtic Park, and it's the same at Ibrox, because of restaurants, travel, hotels, shops, all these kinds of things that are benefiting from these big events, which obviously 50 or 60,000 people attend every single week in Glasgow. But we'll continue to do the daily podcast, Kevin, and we'll continue to to have these discussions and you know I just think when it comes to what happened today on Twitter it's actually a wee bit of light relief because you look at that and you think see back in the 90s like the days I was mentioning with the fanzines Celtic fans were great at taking the piss out of ourselves whereas the see the Rangers what they now they've no sense of humour mate they just honestly it's so it's actually funny for us to look at that today if that is what Rangers are presenting right as evidence oh my word I don't know how you know, if we'll ever find out, but whoever sorted that, and we'll never find out who it was that organised it, it's a stroke of genius, yeah. I know, uh, it's quite incredible, um, but I, I think, in the grand scheme of things, Paul, it's obviously, like you say, that the, the, the death toll is absolutely horrific, and secondary to that, the mental health of people in Scotland is deteriorating rapidly, and if this provides light relief to anyone out there who's missing that fixing, Football is, is life for people and before this all kicked off we had planned a trip to Lisbon. Um, me and my brother were going to take my dad and my papa. My papa's going to be 86 years old this year and the story is that he had a ticket to go to Lisbon and gave it up because my mum and one of my uncles had not long been born and he stayed behind and he's never been. So he went to the final game, uh, the second European Cup final. Um, obviously didn't end <laughs> didn't end too well, um, but missed the Lisbon game and we booked tickets for him to go to Lisbon and we're going to take him to the Estadio Nacional and everyone aside from the bigger picture needs to set a personal goal on where they want to be at the end of this and all I want to do is be able to take that trip with my papa when this is all done and dusted. Absolutely brilliant, Kevin. I had a great pleasure in meeting him at the Bobby Lennox statue unveiling. You introduced me to your papa and you've told me so many tales about his Celtic support and life and. As you say, that's something to look forward to, Kevin, it really is, and it's another big, it's an eye-opener when the likes of young Kane McGinley is found dead during the week there, and I didn't know the young guy, I used to live in Pennycook as it happens, and I bumped into him in Cluj in Romania, and that was our kind of middle ground Celtic, and then, oh do you know this guy from Pennycook, do you know that one? But he, he made a, a huge impression on me, to the point where me and the two gentlemen I was with on that trip spoke about him. We actually spoke about him after the event. So if anybody's had that positive effect on you, you kind of thought to yourself, he is a life and soul of the party, Kevin. And we only spoke to the young guy for 40 minutes. What happened was, he met, he noticed the Jimmy Johnson logo on one of our tracksuit tops. You know, the Lisbon Lions logo. The, the lion that they, they had on the 25th anniversary. And he came right over to us. Now, normally, anywhere, if a, somebody who's had a baby comes over to you, 99 times out of 100, they're going to annoy you. Right, but this young guy was just brilliant, and he made a positive impression on all of us, the whole company. And when I seen that, you know, during the week, I just thought I was heartbroken for the family and for the friends. And I don't know if that's, you know, got any connection to the current situation. I'm, I'm obviously um, just surmising here, but there's loads of people who are really struggling, Kevin. So if you can give them a wee jag for half an hour or an hour talking about Celtic and a wee bit of light entertainment, then great. And I'm glad that you came along. I say came along. You never came along. You're on the end of the, the Zoom. But I'm glad that you joined us tonight for, I think it's your third appearance on a Celtic State of Mind. And the next time, we'll do it in person, Kevin. And uh, it'll be great to see you again on the other side. I'm looking forward to getting down to your uh, your number seven studio, Paul. I, I enjoyed having my chat with uh, your pal Jim from the Jimmy Johnson Charitable Trust. Um, so I'm looking forward to coming down and hearing a few stories and catching up when this is all said and done. And Let's get a beer when it's finished, mate.
So let's do all the things that we've been taking for granted, Kevin. Now, you yep. and your family take care, and I'll speak to you soon, all right? You too. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks again, mate.